Hello, and welcome back to Off the Deaton Path. I'm Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society, and we welcome you to this podcast for November 30th, 2023. We are recording this week from the Department of Regional Identity Studies here at the Georgia Historical Society on the 15th floor of the Jepson House overlooking beautiful Forsyth Park in downtown Savannah. My guest this week is John Shelton Reed. John is a sociologist who has spent his life studying and writing about the American South. He is author or editor of more than 20 books, including Whistling Dixie, Dispatches from the South, My Tears Spoiled My Aim, and Other Reflections on Southern Culture, 1001 Things Everyone Should Know About the South, which he co-authored with his late wife, Dale Volberg reed Cornbread Nation 4, The Best of Southern Food Writing, Holy Smoke, The Big Book of North Carolina Barbecue, and his most recent, John Shelton Reed, On Barbecue. John has also written widely for national publications, such as the Wall Street Journal, the National Review, the Oxford American, and Southern Living. John is a graduate of MIT and received his Ph.D. from Columbia University. He taught at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill for 31 years from 1969 until his retirement in 2000 as William Rand Kennan, Jr. Professor of Sociology and Director of the Howard Odom Institute for Research in Social Science. He helped to found the Center for the Study of the American South and was a founding co-editor of the quarterly Southern Cultures. John has served as president of the Southern Sociological Society, the Southern Association for Public Opinion Research. He was elected to the Fellowship of Southern Writers in 2000, and he has lectured at over 300 colleges and universities in the United States and abroad and held visiting positions at over a dozen more, including Fulbright lectureships in Israel and India and the Pitt Professorship of American History and Institutions at Cambridge University. John has been a Guggenheim Fellow, a Fellow of the National Humanities Center, and twice a Fellow of the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. John is a longtime friend of the Georgia Historical Society. I first met him 20 years ago when we did a roundtable discussion about the Civil War for Georgia Public Broadcasting in Atlanta, and I am delighted to have him here on the podcast today. My conversation with John Shelton Reed begins now. John Shelton Reed, welcome to our podcast. Thanks, Dan. Good to be here. You and I were on a program together that the Georgia Historical Society did almost 20 years ago now called uh, Why Are We Still Fighting the Civil War? And uh, you were, without a doubt, uh, one of the highlights of that show. We still remember it fondly here at GHS. Uh, your your look at your your take on the South and all the things that make the South the South are of course one of the things that you you made your life's work. You're retired now, uh, a, a recovering sociologist. You taught for many years at the University of North Carolina. I, a lot to talk about with you. A lot to ask you. Uh, but first of all, I want to ask. I know you were you were from uh, Kingsport, Tennessee. Right. How did you become interested in studying the South? Well, um, I've actually written about that. Uh, Kingsport's a strange place. It's, uh, it's it's in the mountains for one thing. So I, you know, I never. It's it's an Appalachian kind of South that I grew up in. Uh, also, I grew up in a product of a mixed marriage. My mother's from upstate New York, so uh, I, I was aware of regional differences. Mm. From Eudora Wealthy said once, uh, one of her parents was from West Virginia, and the other from. I forget Ohio or something like that, and, and she she said, uh, growing up, it teaches you there's more than one side to most questions. Uh, that that was my my experience, but I uh, I didn't pay a lot of attention to the South as opposed to you know what was around me until uh, uh, I left it. I, I went north to school and uh, uh, to to uh, college, and it was in Massachusetts in the '60s. Um, and then later in New York, uh, subsequently. And, you know, people kept asking me, that was a, not a great time to be a Southerner outside the South. <laughs> because mm. People were asking you, what are you people doing down there? You know, and, and first of all, I haven't thought of myself as one of you people uh, uh, before. Uh, <laughs> but here I am a, a spokesman, you know. And uh, so I got interested in what it means to, to be a Southerner. And, uh, uh, you know, are there... 
real differences. I, you know, I felt there were real differences. I, you know, what I was living in in Boston and New York was not what I was accustomed to. But I, uh, so I, I, I was majoring in uh, at MIT in political science, but of a very quantitative sort, uh, survey analysis, public opinion studies, that kind of thing. So I started messing around with old Gallup polls that had been done starting in the 30s and running up through the 60s and looking at regional differences, uh, you know, and, and I wound up uh, at Columbia, I wound up writing my dissertation on regional differences using those old Gallup polls. Uh, basically, I set out to show that uh, regional differences were going away because everybody knew they were, you know, the South was getting more industrialized, more urban, and people education levels going up, all this stuff. But it uh, turns out that uh, the ways I was looking at it, there weren't regional differences weren't getting smaller. They were hanging in there. So um, that was my dissertation. That became my first book called The Endearing South. Uh, I don't know that I could write that book today. Because um, one thing that's happened that I did not anticipate, and my only defense is nobody else anticipated it either. I mean, I was not alone, but nobody saw the great wave of migration to the South that's taken place since the time I was writing, just about the time I was writing. More people started moving to the South than were leaving it, you know, which was not something anybody expected. But here we are. And some places like here in the Research Triangle of North Carolina, uh, you know, uh, the retirement community I live in, most people here are not from the South. You know, they retired here. Uh, some of them have children that moved here to work at Research Triangle and stuff like that, grandchildren. But uh, so anyhow, uh, many parts of the South uh, whatever you meant by Southern, it don't look all that Southern anymore. Uh, so when you say you couldn't have written that book, you what you mean is it, with that title, with the Enduring South, you, it, from your opinion, this has changed the South that has not endured in the way that it was. Well, you know, I, th I think I could write the Enduring Southerner because mm -hmm. if you look at people who tell you they're Southerners who are around here, a minority uh, in my neighborhood, uh, I think they're st we are still different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the ways I, I talked about, but we are uh, uh, in many parts of the South, if not a minority, at least just one part of the picture. Uh, and you, now you don't have to go too far from here. You go, you know, 50 miles east of here and you're an old tobacco country and you've got counties that are struggling to hang on to their population, much less <laughs> they're not getting new ones. And people. Yeah. Moving. And those parts of the South still look pretty Southern uh, in the old fashioned way. You know, and if I need my batteries recharged, I go down to parts of Mississippi and Alabama and <laughs> get well, a, get you a know, boot that, shot. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And that and that begs the question, when we talk about the South, are we really talking about the urban rural divide? That the rural people are still southern. The yeah. urban places, Atlanta, Charlotte, um, it, it, any others you may think of are not all that Southern anymore, that that great migration went into the cities and the suburbs. Is Am I right about that? Or uh, Yes and no, because, I mean, uh, a lot of retirement migration went to places like Wilmington and Boone, you know, the coast and the mountains. And the, mm. these are urban places, but uh, mm. uh, 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 they've got you know as many uh, retired uh, Yankees as, as, as we have here. Uh, <laughs> It's 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 not strictly urban rural, and if you go to urban places, I mean, you mentioned Atlanta. That's everybody's favorite example. Of the New South doesn't look southern. That's not true. I think if you go to uh, you know, some neighborhoods in Atlanta, particularly African American ones, it's uh, you're still in a very southern uh, setting. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, on the other hand, there are great swatches of suburb that uh, might as well be in Cleveland. You know, uh, the weather's better, but. Uh, <laughs> What do you make of, and this is just out of the blue, this is one of the things, one of the things that's happened that uh, I mentioned this program that you and I did with GHS 20 years ago about the Civil War. It, the, the Confederate symbolism has uh, only come under more uh, fire since then. A lot has happened. A lot has changed. What do you make of the fact that it is now the Republican Party that seem to be the people defending the Confederacy when the Republicans, the Republican Party's origins, of course, were what caused the Civil War in some ways, right? The election of a Republican president. Oh, yeah. The Democrats, How does a sociologist view that? No, the Democrats were the party of, historically of you know, states' rights and white supremacy. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, mm -hmm. some states, they campaigned under the slogan, white supremacy. They weren't embarrassed about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, 
No, there's been that reversal. I think, uh, you know, if you look at uh, black voting patterns, it switched with Franklin Roosevelt. I mean, up until then, uh, African-Americans had been a reliably Republican voting bloc because uh, the Republicans were their friends from Reconstruction days. Uh, uh, but that changed it with Roosevelt and solidified with uh, Linda Johnson and, and now uh, African-Americans, one of the most reliably Democratic voting blocs around, although that may be changing at the edges. That's another story. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, uh, Goldwater campaign and, and that that period there uh, solidified uh, Republicans as as the party of, of white Southerners. You go to a state like Mississippi, uh, you know, I forget the numbers, but it's, you know, 90 percent of black folks voted Democratic and 75, 80 percent of white folks voting Republican. It's a real polarization. The upshot is, you know, a wash. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it is very much a racial thing in the parts of the Deep South still. <laughs> and again, I say that may be changing. We'll see. But the, the Confederate symbolism thing. Yeah, that, they're to it's toxic now. You know, uh, when we were talking about it 20 years ago. Uh, there, there were, you know, you could make jokes about you forget hell, you know, Colonel Reb, they're, they're waving his flag and this kind of thing. Yeah. Um, no, it, it's, it's, that's a lost cause. I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just melted down Robert E. Lee's statue. <laughs> yeah. The other yeah. Day. I go to church pretty regularly at uh, Duke Chapel over the campus of Duke University. They had uh, six figures flanking the door, you know, uh, characters of them. They were, Figures that meant a lot to Mr. Duke, uh, Thomas Jefferson's one, uh, Martin Luther's one, uh, <laughs> John Wesley's another, Robert E. Lee was another. Well, now mm -hmm. there are five, five figures flanking the door. There's an empty plinth where Robert E. Lee stood. He's gone. Mm -hmm. And they haven't replaced him with anything. I don't know whether they will or not. But uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> in odd ways, <laughs> I'm talking too much, but uh, <laughs> that, that that Duke Chapel is, is this gothic thing they built in the 1920s, you know, that... You know, it's a remarkable piece of Gothic revival architecture. It doesn't look a whole lot like uh, European cathedrals because it's too clean and too neat, you know. But but now you got missing statues. That that's very, you know. Yeah. Here, here come the uh, iconoclasts that knock the heads off all the statues. Well, Robert E. Lee's gone. You know, all the mm -hmm. icons mm -hmm. are falling. So you knock a few more heads off the of statues and knock them down. It's gonna gonna look more more realistic. What so um. How does a guy from uh, a young man from Kingsport, Tennessee, end up going to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1960? Oh, oh. What what year was it? I went in uh, 1960. Yeah. Okay. That was a mistake, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you were misinformed. <laughs> well, I, 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 was, I, I was hot stuff in East Tennessee algebra circles, you know. <laughs> so I said, "Well, I'm pretty good at algebra. Maybe I'll be a mathematician." So, uh, <laughs> and. Uh, Kingsport, my hometown, was an Eastman Kodak company town, so we had a lot of uh, chemical engineers and stuff like that, many of them from Rochester, New York, uh, and some of them were MIT guys, and they said, well, you want to be a mathematician, obviously you have to go to MIT, so I said, well, all right, so I applied, and I got in, and uh, I went, and very quickly figured out that uh, I was out of my league, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there were these 16 year old kids from you know Bronx High School of Science who just shut me down. I mean, they were so smart. And uh, they got it the first time. I had to work really hard. So I figured I worked really, really hard. I could be a mediocre mathematician. And uh, uh, you know, one of the guys I was with, I'm still in touch with, he just won the Turing Prize, which is a million dollar prize for achievement in mathematics. <clears throat> he invented the algorithm that makes internet commerce possible, you know. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so, I mean, I knew he was smart. <laughs> He's still smart. <laughs> that, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's amazing. I'm, I'm kind of flattered that he deigns to hang out with me, you know. But, <laughs> so you majored in political science. Well, yeah, I, I kind of drifted. Uh, I didn't know what to do, but I kind of drifted in, into statistics, which is the, you know, the easier kind of mathematics. <laughs> Mathematicians kind of look down on statisticians, I think. Mm -hmm. but, um, and then from statistics, I got interested in the. Uh, uh, I took some courses in political science, and they were doing uh, survey research and number crunching kind of kind of political social science. And I thought, you know, this is kind of interesting, and it's not that hard, and I can do it. And uh, uh, so I, I wound up with a degree in political science and mathematics. They wouldn't you had to do a double major, but all my math courses were statistics or computer science or something like that. Mm -hmm. 
And then he went on to get a PhD in, at Columbia. In sociology, which um, the kind of math, political science I was doing at MIT, the kind of sociology that did at Columbia were pretty much the same. I mean, a lot of quantitative social research was what we called it in those days. Mm -hmm. So, so what was it like being in New York City in the early 60s? Well, uh, this was this was the late, late 60s. 60s. Yeah, yeah okay. I, was, I was in Columbia in 1968 when all hell broke loose. Oh, it? Okay, tell you us know. about that. <laughs> well, uh, we were talking earlier. You said uh, some of your ancestors were on the wrong side of the revolution. I was on the wrong side of that revolution. I was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wasn't particularly sympathetic to to the strikers. Um, I thought that they were being manipulated by some of the hardcore SDS people. Mm -hmm. the, who had it, something, something different in mind from what the strikers said they were. And for the benefit of our listeners, SDS was Students for a Democratic Society. Is that correct? It was. And mm -hmm. uh, that's a long story. Yeah. But basically, I, I was out of sympathy with, with them, and I got more out of sympathy with them when I uh, I was a teaching assistant, had to cross the picket line to teach my courses, and I got pushed and bullied and shoved around. So, so that got my back up. Mm. But as I say, I... <laughs> I was uh, I was on the unpopular side of that uh, struggle, uh, wrong side of the barricades. Uh, but you know that's history. Now I, I ran into a, one of one of my classmates who was red hot on the other side, and you know, t thirty years later, he said, "You know, you were right." And I, I said, "You know, I don't often hear that." <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things I noticed on on your you, you got a list on your website of five uh, influential books that were important in your life, and you noted on there that it was at that period that you read Edmund Burke's book, yes. "Reflections on the French Revolution." Yes. Uh, well, I uh, my politics were kind of muddled. I mean, I was, I was uh, you know sort of mainstream liberal. I, I thought I was liberal East Tennessee terms. I was. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, at Columbia, I, I, I thought these, uh, my, my classmates, the revolutionaries were endangering something that uh, I thought was important. I mean, uh, this is a venerable university and yes, it did stuff wrong. It treated, Many students like they didn't exist, and it was basically set up for the benefit of the faculty. I could, I could, I could list problems with Columbia. I could understand where the complaints were coming from, but uh, you know, people were demanding abolition of requirements. You know, uh, not going to have any requirements. So, mm -hmm. uh, abolition of grades. We weren't going to have any grades. We're gonna, uh, and. Uh, Basically, the abolition of, of uh, any sort of hierarchy. Well, I, said, I, I believed in hierarchy. I mean, there, there were guys there that knew stuff I didn't know because that's why I was there, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Anyhow, uh, <clears throat> long story. Uh, mm -hmm. and I, I, I can't remember why I read Burke, but uh, uh, somebody must have recommended him. But I, I read him and I, it resonated with me. I mean, here's, here's this guy. He's a. Uh, He's a Whig. He's not a Tory. He, he, he's, a, he's a liberal Englishman, but he's kind of horrified by what was going on in France. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, writes a very uh, articulate defense of tradition. And reform rather than revolution. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Uh, I, I, I still go back occasionally and read Burke because he's. Uh, yeah. I find him a kindred spirit. <laughs> I, I know more than one person who has said that they. Uh, They've been deeply influenced by that book. So I, that, that's why I wanted to bring that up. So from there, you, you go on and begin uh, a very long and distinguished career, I think, at the University of North Carolina in their sociology department. Is that correct? Well, you kind of describe it that way, but it was a bit it was long, certainly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 1969 to 2000, right? 31 I, years? 31 yeah. years, yeah. I, I went there straight out of graduate school. And, and uh, you know, I, I wanted to get back to the South. I was married by then, and my wife was pregnant. So I, you know, I, I wanted my kids to grow up Southern. I, by that point, it was important to me. And uh, at that time, uh, the late 60s, none of my classmates at Columbia wanted jobs in the South. I mean, you, know, mm -hmm. if you wanted to go to the South. You got interviews left and right all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, so North Carolina was far and away the best sociology department in the south and i knew the area dale my wife uh, my late wife uh, had been an undergraduate at duke so i you know i, I knew the area her, her brother was in med school at duke i had cousins in durham um so uh, 
I got an offer from Chapel Hill and, and uh, I thought it was perfect, you know, and it became even more perfect. The year I came, 69, two old timers in the sociology department retired. There was Rupert Vance and Guy Johnson, both of whom were distinguished sociologists who had spent much of their career studying the South. And mm -hmm. uh, Rupert Vance taught a course called the sociology of the South. And uh, when I was, after I'd taken the job, my chairman said, would you like to teach Dr. Vance's course on the South? He's retiring. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, you know, throw me in that briar patch. And, and <laughs> I taught that course for 31 years. It, I didn't teach the same course he did. My interests were different from his. He was he was basically a demographer. He was interested in population movements, and he was interested in the South's social problems to the extent that I wasn't because many of the social problems were, you know, 1969, you're not going to talk about tenant farming, except mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but so it's a different course. And in fact, it was different at the end than it had been at the beginning, because I kept, you know, turning up new things I wanted to talk about and thought were important. So, but that, that was a great opportunity and, and just a sheer piece of luck. You know, uh, my, my career has been marked by lucky breaks, uh, often say the best career move I ever made was being born in 1942, you know, because I, I came out in a self market, you know, my classmates at Columbia, most of them had jobs to choose from. It was not a question of, uh, you know, desperately seeking any job you could get. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it had nothing to do with how good we were. It just had to do with how few of us there were. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> so, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what the South is, what it was, let's say, when you started your career, what we are now. There was a time, I know, historically anyway, where being Southern was really about being a white Southerner, I should yeah, say, yeah, was really about a certain set of racial attitudes. Would you racial, agree with that? Yeah, racial attitudes. And, and uh, uh, Ulrich B. Phillips, distinguished uh, mm -hmm. ultra-conservative Southern historian, said that the cardinal test of a Southerner, he meant white Southerner, was a commitment to white supremacy. Well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't quite believe that. Uh, probably uh, coming from the mountains uh, had something to do with that. But I, I, I thought the South was about uh, maybe about that, and certainly in parts of the South it was about that. But it was about other things too, uh, you know, religion and uh, humor and and uh, recreation and uh, recreational activities. And uh, yeah, I started listening. I could start listing things. Uh, We'll do list some. I mean, what do you, what defined a Southerner in 1969 or 70? What, as a, and we'll come up to the present. I mean, okay. like what? Well, what in 69, this uh, commitment to uh, uh, white supremacy and the commitment to support for symbols of the Confederacy were no longer absolute requirements. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, uh, it we could joke around and I did with with the Confederate flag. You know, it was a. Symbol of identity wasn't symbol of much of anything else. I mean, you, you fly a Confederate flag when you're a student at Harvard, as one one girl did. It just means I'm I'm a Southerner in your face, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Doesn't mean much beyond that. Or you have to ask what it means. Um, so, uh, what largely made my career studying the South was, at some point, I said, you know, being a Southerner. And this being in New York helped with this. Being a Southerner is kind of like being an Italian American or an Irish American or, you know, a Jew. Uh, it's it's a it's an identity. Uh, it's got something to do with, with history, sure, uh, and ancestry, but it's it's got more to do with things in common in the present. And uh, you know, you speak in the same language, you understand each other. Uh, somewhat easier than you understand other people and there are symbols of membership that you can play around with so basically i said let's let's see how far we can get let's see how far we can get by looking at southerners and at that time i meant white southerners because they were easier to study mm -hmm. more um, survey data on them but let's see how far we can get by saying the, they're an ethnic group or they're like an ethnic group a quasi-ethnic group mm -hmm. We look at questions of identity. We look about stereotypes. People write about ethnic stereotypes. So let's look at stereotypes of Southerners. There are some, you know. <laughs> Nobody had really written about this or looked at it in a serious way, but everybody knew it was there. Uh, let's look at questions of uh, social distance. I mean, how important is it that uh, your child marry someone of the same ethnicity? Or the, the, you know, does it matter to you whether your child marries a Southerner or a non-Southerner? 
And <clears throat> let's look at who it matters to and who it doesn't. I mean, some Southerners identify strongly, others don't. It's a matter of indifference. Uh, so a, a lot of questions follow once you ask that, how are they like and unlike uh, other, like immigrant ethnic groups or religious ethnic groups, racial groups even. So uh, that basically became my, uh, I guess my second book or third, I can't remember which one called Southerners, the Social Psychology of Sectionalism. I looked at questions of identity and stereotyping and regional consciousness and, you know, some interesting stuff turned up when you started uh, looking at survey data on it. I, I, we, we, I generated some, we did a little survey. Uh, I wish we'd been a bigger one, but uh, made a lot of mileage with what we had. You know, who, who is self-conscious about being a Southerner? Well, it turns out it's not people that live in, you know, uh, deepest deep South where they don't meet anybody who isn't a Southerner. The people <laughs> are most conscious about being a Southerner. People like me that have spent time outside the South and run into people that aren't and view him as some sort of you know, specimen. And uh, he sees them as, as as different. So he starts, so it's, it, it, you know, I, I went further with it. I, I, I was going to stream with it, but other people had the same experience of uh, being with non-Southerners, whether they lived outside the South, they went in the Army with them, you know, they went to any number of ways you could run into them and realize that there are differences here and, and they're, you know, they're, you have to explain some things to them that you don't have to explain to the people you grew up with. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, anyhow, I got a lot of mileage out of that uh, over the years. I mean, the next 30 odd one years, that's mostly what I wrote about. And uh, I got in a situation in the 90s where I, the Atlanta Journal Constitution and the Research Institute that I was director of, we co sponsored a survey uh, called the Southern Focus Poll, which is a national telephone survey, but we oversampled Southerners, you know, so you could look at different kinds of Southerners, you know. Southerners turn out to be you know, 25, 30% of a national sample, but we made them sort of 60%, 60, 70% of ours. So we could we could look at Southerners versus non-Southerners, and then we'd go inside the Southern sample and look at blacks versus whites or uh, you know, college graduates versus others. It's hard, harder to do with a representative national sample. And so what what did Southerners, uh, what were the characteristics? Are they the ones that we would associate or we think about at that time? Well, Accent, um, religion. Yeah, accent, religion, humor, uh, uh, taste food. in music, uh, food, uh, uh, recreation. I mean, uh, at one point, I don't know if it's still true, but at one point, uh, uh, what, what was it? What was that? Anyway, gun ownership, for example, were much more widespread in the South than outside, and and not just not just because Southerners are more likely to hunt, although they they were probably still are. Uh, you know, there's a ethic of self reliance. I think that crops up in things like a homicide race. You know, you've got a you got a quarrel with somebody, you you go settle it man to man. Um, and sometimes that means violently. Uh, you look at homicide rates, and I did uh, the kind of homicide rates that are higher in the South are kind that of come out of arguments. You know, it's not somebody knocking over a liquor store, shooting the clerk. It's uh, it's personal grievances that, that are settled violently and that's the kind of music kind of homicide that uh, kind of violence the country music's about mm. mm -hmm. yeah I wrote an article about violence in country music in fact i wrote a song a country song about violence <laughs> but, with, uh, with the title tell give us the title <laughs> my tears spoil my aim <laughs> that, that, that's yeah, one. i'm gonna ask you about all that yeah, yeah. That, that, that that's one and then i wrote another one that, that's from a man's point of view he's sitting in prison complaining because he's didn't manage to kill his wife. He tried, but he couldn't shoot straight because he's crying too hard. Uh, <laughs> and then at equal time, I wrote one from a woman's point of view called 38 caliber divorce, which. <laughs> so, which uh, these have all just been recently published, right? Well, I, I self published a collection. Yes. Yes. My, my song. Yes. Works, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I want to ask you about those in just a minute. Well, to to talk about this for just for a second, the, the, these regional characteristics. I mean, is it is it fair to say? Is it safe to say? I mean, there was a there was a whole cottage industry at one point. You know, in the eighties and nineties, people like Louis Grizzard, yeah. um, the the widespread fascination and nationalization of NASCAR, stock car racing, 
uh, country music, you know, sort of went, it just became the, the idea that the South became a commodity, but in some ways it's sort of like, don't all regions in America, can't they make the same claims to having very distinctive voices, very distinctive music, very distinctive, um, religion, food. I mean, Midwesterners that I meet, my goodness, they are, a, they are a clan unto themselves. Are they not still? Yes and no, but the, historically, I think the South's been the most uh, self-conscious and the most obstreperous, uh, <laughs> the most assertive about its distinctiveness. Uh, uh, what was it, uh, Thomas Wolfe? Uh, what did he say about uh, regional difference? He said, uh, uh, the North is provincial and doesn't know it, and the Midwest is provincial, knows it, and is ashamed of it. The South's provincial, knows it, and doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> right, yes. Yeah, so, glo glory in it. Yeah. And yeah. Is, is all of this stuff still in place in 2023? Yes and no. I, I said uh, that, uh, you know, we've been uh, sort of uh, diluted on, on the ground <laughs> by, by migrants. I think if you went in and looked at self-identified Southerners, and I don't have the resources to do it or, uh, uh, and or the inclination to try to raise the resources to do it. But I bet if you went in and looked at self-identified Southerns, you'd find this stuff persisting pretty well. Mm. Perhaps, perhaps even aggravated in some cases by the presence of non-Southerners, you know, right. who made them aware of what they're on the brink of losing. Uh, yeah. So let's talk for a moment about one of the things that you have also made, I think, your life's work and that you think is absolutely essential, I think, to Southern identity, if it's not just good American food. And that's barbecue. Oh, yeah. How does yeah. that fit into all of this? Well, you know, I retired I, I, after 31 years at UNC. I was still a relatively young man, but I, I was uh, in the state pension system. At some point, I realized, you know, I've, I've got a, 31 years, I could retire on this pension. I don't have to go to faculty meetings anymore. So uh, <laughs> also, my teaching was beginning to suffer, I think. I, you know, I couldn't remember whether I told a joke this year or last, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think, so uh, I, I, I took the money and, and, and ran. Uh, and uh, it's always been the case. I've been lucky. I could write about pretty much whatever I, I wanted to. Certainly once I got tenure, that's what tenure is about, you know, but fortunately what I wanted to write for my first 30 years was stuff that uh, looked sort of looked like social science, or most of it, much of it. But after I retired, I, you know, I was unleashed. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I wanted to write about. Well, uh, I've been cooking barbecue right along. My, this is a mighty long story, Stan. You can edit it out. But, uh, my late wife, Dale, was at Duke in the early 60s, and one of her sweetmates, she had two sweetmates, one of them was a girl named uh, Linda uh, Moore who f from Ashland, Virginia, but Linda's father uh, was from Durham, so he came to visit uh, his daughter and took the girls out to Turnage's Barbecue. Uh, this was Dale's first contact with North Carolina barbecue. Now, East Tennessee does not have much in the way of barbecue. I've written an essay of, uh, about it, basically proving that this is so and saying, I don't know why it's so. But uh, uh, so she ran into this stuff. She loved it. I came to visit her and she took me out there and I loved it too. So uh, when we were in Durham for one reason or another, visiting her brother, we'd go to Turnages. And when we, when I took a job here in 69, Turnages was still there. We'd eat barbecue there and other places around here once a month or so. And I started cooking it at some point just uh, just for amusement. And uh, after I had retired, um, I was, Dale and I were eating. Oh, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> Let me back up a minute. This girl, Linda Moore, uh, whose father introduced Dale and the, then me, to uh, North Carolina barbecue. Uh, my wife, Dale, died five years ago. I've been married to Linda for uh, two years now. <laughs> so <laughs> full circle. Uh, she she, she uh, had a life in Charlottesville where she was married to a UVA professor, but uh, he, he's gone. Anyway, um, so uh, where was I? Oh, yes, barbecue. Uh, we were dining with David Perry, the editor-in-chief of the UNC Press, who is also a barbecue enthusiast, and uh, discovered we both knew a book called Legends of Texas Barbecue by Rob Walsh. He's a friend of mine now. 
and it's a collection of interviews and recipes and history and photographs and lore about Texas barbecue. It's a great book. And somebody at the table said, you know, somebody ought to do something like this for North Carolina because we've got barbecue too, you know, ours is better than theirs. Uh, <laughs> so, so Dave and I kind of looked at each other and said, well, we will. We will write that book. And Perry said, well, get me a proposal. So wrote a proposal and, and uh, he bought it. They even gave us an advance, which is unusual for the university president. And we wrote the book and uh, had a lot of fun doing it. Turns out we'd already done a lot of the work because after I retired, we started doing stuff like driving to Lexington, North Carolina for lunch. You know, this is a... <laughs> <laughs> famous barbecue places around the state that we'd heard of but hadn't been to. You know, So mm-hmm. they'll have been taking pictures of plates and pictures of people, pictures of you know, restaurant front signs and all this stuff. So we had a lot of the illustrations already. And uh, anyway, we had a lot of fun writing it. And I, I'm proud of that book. Holy Smoke, it's called The Big Book of North Carolina Barbecue. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was, I'm pleased to say it was a great success. It came out in November, but it was the, the UNC Press's best selling book of the year. Wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Everybody gave it to their father in law for Christmas. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So, anyhow, that was fun. And then uh, I thought, well, we've read this book, you know, kind of shot our wad. But then uh, then the press came up with this series of little cookbooks, uh, slim books, no photographs, no illustrations, just recipes based on sort of their word, not mine, iconic Southern foods. So we had a buttermilk cookbook and a cornbread cookbook and, and a uh a peaches cookbook and like that. And they thought they needed a barbecue cookbook in this series. And I, I wasn't going to argue with them. The world did not need another barbecue cookbook. I've got 30 of them, you know, but this series needed a barbecue cookbook. So mm-hmm. they asked us if we would do it. Uh, and simultaneously, I said yes. And Dale said no. <laughs> so I wound up doing this myself, although she uh, tested an awful lot of recipes. I mean, she ate an awful lot of the stuff that I cook. I tested all of the recipes in the book with one exception, that being barbecued snoots, big snouts from uh, East St. Louis. It's a specialty there. But uh, <laughs> I didn't test that recipe. I got it from a, another woman's cookbook. She says it has the consistency of a dog's chew toy. And it's an so <laughs> un- unpleasant odor. So I thought, <laughs> I don't need to verify this. I'll take her word for it. <laughs> but it needs to be in there for completeness. <laughs> so anyhow, that uh, that was book number two. And then uh, a year or two after that, I realized that over the years, I'd written essays and book reviews and stuff like that about barbecue. And if I collected all these things and you know, took some excerpts from the two books I'd already written about barbecue. I'd have a third book, a collection. Uh, and uh, University of Tennessee Press published that one. It's called On Barbecue. I like that title. It's sort of a magisterial kind of thing. John Shelton Reed, On Barbecue. On Barbecue, right, yes. <laughs> but, yes, uh, I've got it right here in front of me. Oh, yeah. Well, th- th- that book, I think, is kind of kind of fun. Uh, it's got recipes. I uh, Some of my own, actually. There are a couple of, there's a recipe in there for a, barbecue cocktail that uh, i'm right proud of it got well if i want you to describe as you did in this book what it was like to do the memphis and may competition you you describe walking up to it what you smelled what you saw the people who were there can you can you sort of give us an abridged version of that sure this is back in the late 80s one of the first things i ever wrote about barbecue actually you know i'd been eating it uh in north carolina and at my travels elsewhere but my sister lived in memphis and late 80s Memphis and May is this huge international, <laughs> it is an international barbecue cooking competition. But uh, at that point, it was not as serious as it has become. It's now a matter of, you know, serious prize money and, and serious competition. It was basically in the 80s, it was a chance for guys to get together on the waterfront in Memphis, cook barbecue, and, uh, drink beer and uh, stage silly skits and things like that. So my sister knew the lady who picked the judges. So I, I was, they said, would you like to be a judge? <laughs> they don't do it that casually anymore. You have to go through training, you know, <laughs> mm. but uh, they, they got a bunch of us in the movie theater and gave us about an hour and a half instruction of what to look for in, in the perfect rack of ribs. And 
then the next day they sent us out to judge. But uh, <clears throat> that was a spectacle, and it still is. I mean, if you're ever in Memphis when this is going on, check it out because it, it's uh, it's crazy. I mean, and uh, at least in, in that at that time, I think they may have had to move it off the riverfront now, so it won't be the same. I I, I don't know. I haven't been back, but a uh, hundred and something teams cooking barbecue and various kinds of, you know, some of them fancy rigs with uh, all the prizes they won previously hung up around it and, you know, big sound systems pump, pumping out music. And, and, but the thing that nails you when you walk around the corner is the smell, it's this aroma of hickory smoke and, and sizzling pork fat that just hits, hits you in the face. And I think it's wonderful. You know, it, it'd be a vegetarian nightmare, but I, it, it, <laughs> We 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 carnivores gonna resonate, <laughs> but uh, and barbecue people are fun. I mean, uh, these days because it's gotten so commercial and it's on television, you know, the competitions on television, and you got guys that come on like professional wrestlers and all the trash talk and stuff like that. But but uh, at the lower levels <laughs> where you're not competing for thousands of dollars in prize money, uh, it's just guys having a good time and trying to perfect their barbecue and uh they're, they're a very genial bunch good fun to hang out with now one of the things you've been involved in <clears throat> you started it i think is this uh what you're calling campaign for real barbecue oh and yes you, and you have a website which i want you to tell everybody about but what what is the what's the issue at play here okay well um in north carolina in the carolinas and elsewhere but especially noticeable i think in the carolinas there has been a tendency of barbecue restaurants to move away from cooking barbecue with wood. They fire up the gas cooker, you know. And what you get, in my view, if you're cooking <clears throat> pork with, in Carolinas, it's pork. If you're cooking it with gas, you've got roast pork, you know. Put some sauce on it, doesn't make it barbecue. It's it's, it's just roast pork <laughs> with, <laughs> with, with sauce. <laughs> so, uh, uh, a fellow named Dan Levine and I, Dan was a UNC student when I was teaching. He wasn't my student, but we knew what got to know one another. Uh, he had a, he had a blog. He's Jewish. He had a blog called BBQ Jew, barbecue Jew. <laughs> he, it was about North Carolina barbecue. He, anyhow, we were talking one day and we, we both lamenting this switch away because we thought there are hundreds, I mean, still uh, several hundred barbecue places in North Carolina that sell what they call barbecue. There used to be four or five times as many, but uh, there's still hundreds. And of those, we thought maybe 30 were still cooking entirely with wood. You know, uh, some, particularly some of the newer ones, are cooking with gas and throwing some wood chips in, so at least you get a little smoke. But a lot of them just cooking entirely with gas, basically oven-cooked pork, you know. And we thought, this is terrible. And what can we do about it? So we said, well, we could. I'm familiar. I spent a lot of time in England over the years. I'm familiar with something called the campaign for real ale, which uh, the Brits got going when this kind of fizzy, one of my friends called Euro fizz uh, <laughs> lager was taken over. Uh, they said, no, we're going we're to campaign for real ale, real proper British ale. So we started the campaign for real barbecue. What we do uh, and we go around, we try to find people that are cooking hundred percent with wood. We uh, give them a decal to stick on the door and, and a certificate to hang, and we list them on our website. And uh, it turned out there were more than we thought. Maybe well, there might be 50 or so instead of uh, 50 or 60 instead of 25 or 30. But still, it's it's a minority, a very small minority of, of places that are in the barbecue business around here. So uh, we've done a few other things, uh, you know, but and we've expanded. We now have a branch in Kentucky and one in uh, Virginia and one in uh, South Carolina, one in Georgia. Uh, I think that's it. We had one in Mississippi for a while, but our our uh, satrap down down there, unfortunately, uh, passed away and did not leave a successor. Texas doesn't need us. Texans, God bless them, cook 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 with wood, and they also. Uh, share with North Carolinians the view the view that barbecue is not about sauce. You know, it's barbecue before you put any sauce on it. In fact, in Texas, they often don't put any sauce on it at all. It, 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 they, they let the meat speak for itself. You know, mm -hmm. barbecue is really about how it's cooked, right? 
Well, I would say so. Yeah, it's cooked for a long time at a low temperature, relatively low temperature with uh, heat and smoke from hardwood. You know, that's my definition. So yep. uh, at, at the campaign for real barbecue, we talk about and condemn what we call faux Q. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> In fact, I've button lapel buttons we give out say no folk you, but that's uh, uh, anyway. and, and by the way, what's the website called? I mean, how do you get to oh, it? Yeah. Yes, the website is trueq.org, T R U E C U E dot O R G. Okay, now go ahead. True so Texas, Texas. yeah, trueq.org. So I'm, I'm just saying that uh, you know, Texas doesn't need us, but now one of the, the real distinctions here the the great argument right that that it maybe it does is not really an argument but <clears throat> texas barbecue is beef is it not and barbecue everywhere else in the southeast is pork texas barbecue can be beef i, I mean uh, the, the the sort of signature texas dish these days is brisket beef brisket yeah uh, they also do sauce well we're talking about texas barbecue we're really talking about barbecue from central texas i mean there okay there are other things going on in other parts of the state but what people mean when they say Texas barbecue is actually out of a German and Czech meat market tradition. And that's a long story, but mm. the, the Rob Walsh tells in his book, Legends of Texas Barbecue. But so <laughs> they're, they're cooking brisket, uh, partly because they have cows there and more cows than pigs, and it's not true the rest of the stuff, but also because Eastern European, you know, Germans uh, into brisket, you know, and they're cooking sausage and calling that some sausage as barbecue. Uh, you know, <laughs> again, this is a Eastern European thing. There's a place in Elgin, Texas. Elgin is kind of the barbecue sausage capital of the world. Uh, they sell what they call hot guts. <laughs> These are very, very highly spiced sausages in, mm. in natural casings. Uh, and they also do pork. And in fact, in some places they do goat. In fact, they go barbecue just about anything. But uh, uh <laughs> You know, the Aztecs used to barbecue little dogs. I mean, that might have... <laughs> Which is where the word comes from, is it not? Barbecue? Uh, but, uh, little dogs? No, it, it comes from the, the Aztec, right? Oh, the word uh, itself. Oh, oh not, not the Aztecs. It comes from the uh, Indians in the Caribbean. Ah, okay, right. Uh, it, it, you're right, it's Indians, but it's not the Mexican ones. Okay. Uh, that's another story I'd be glad to tell you in a minute. <laughs> anyway. Well, uh, as you know, down here in the low country, um, we have uh, there's there's a uh, mustard based. Oh yeah. There's there's tomato based. Mm. There's vinegar based. Are any of those uh, particular to a region, which is which is what I've been led to believe? And are you partial to any one in particular? Well, um, first question. Yes, they are. Uh, they have been uh, native to particular regions. This mustard sauce, for example, is a stretch from Columbia, South Carolina, down to down to the coast, down to Charleston where uh this is the sauce is a mustard based yellow sauce kind of alarming school bus school bus yellow but uh until recently everybody else uh, if they knew about it at all you know put it down but uh now you're starting to get what i call the international house of barbecue model often chains that sell all different kinds of barbecue different meats different sauces mix and match customers always right but Hitherto, uh, you go to some place and there is a kind of barbecue that is native to it, and they they will insist or used to insist that this was barbecue and nothing else was. Okay, so in eastern North Carolina, for example, and adjacent part of South Carolina, the PD region, you get whole hog barbecue. First of all, it's pork. It's, you roast the whole animal, you cook the whole animal. Uh, you serve it with a sauce that is basically vinegar, red pepper, uh, salt, not much else. And that's a historical sauce, by the way. That's that used to be the sauce everywhere <laughs> uh, after the, it came abroad, aboard from the early early 1900s. <laughs> there's, there's so much to be said about this. I keep getting this, this sidetracked. But anyhow, uh, you run into this, and you know you're in eastern North Carolina or PD region of South Carolina, west of Raleigh. Uh, you're cooking probably just pork shoulders, not the whole animal. And you're putting a still a vinegar based sauce, but it's got some ketchup in it, a little bit of red to make it a little sweeter, a little more uh, umami, excuse the word. Uh, uh, Western uh, Piedmont, North Carolina, around Lexington, Salisbury, you get 
what is basically a German dish, and it's no accident that there are a lot of Lutherans there, that, that that area was settled by Germans that came out of the valley. Uh, you know, deep south, uh, you got a, they're cooking ribs. You, know, you don't get ribs or you, here at four. You have not gotten ribs in North Carolina barbecue places, except as a byproduct of whole hog cooking. But you want ribs, you go to a rib place, you know, <laughs> you want barbecue. Uh, mm-hmm. In Tuscaloosa, you say barbecue, what you're talking about is ribs. Uh, and same with Memphis. Uh, pork shoulder sometimes too, but also, but r- ribs are kind of the, signature product go to kansas city uh everything goes anything goes in kansas city that's another story but uh deep south memphis kansas city you're getting a thick sweet sauce that's basic you know in the carolinas sauce is vinegar with stuff in it <laughs> mm-hmm. deep south memphis kansas city it's ketchup with stuff in it you know mm-hmm. it's thick it's sweet it may not be particularly hot or it could be hot but but thick and sweet, uh, and it sits on top of the meat. Uh, what we call sauce in the Carolinas, really more a seasoning. I mean, because it's thin, you know, it doesn't. You don't mop it on; it sits there on the surface. It, it permeates the mm-hmm. the meat. Uh, and and down here, it's mustard with stuff in it, right? Yeah, George is a peculiar, uh, or the Low Country, I should say. Yeah, uh, that's a spillover, I think, from from South Carolina. From yeah. Charleston area and you get out around Athens uh I don't really know what I'm talking about I, I should refer you to to our our, our Georgia branch of the campaign <laughs> 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 uh, there, there are places uh, there was a place at least Athens that used a sauce very much like an eastern eastern Carolina sauce yeah but it's not mustard for sure that's not vinegar. Georgia that's low country yeah it's vinegar based you know mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so Georgia is kind of a hodgepodge uh in an interesting way but it, again it's it's local it's, it's geographically specific now that is it's kind of like uh kind of like the influx of migrants to the south <laughs> you, you now have texas barbecue cropping up everywhere i mean it's an invasive, right. invasive species they're cooking brisket now <laughs> in lexington north carolina which is just wrong you know uh but but they're doing it and mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, personally i like with one exception i like every kind of barbecue i know but i like it in its place <laughs> You know, I, mm-hmm. I go to Austin. I want to eat brisket, I, I, yeah. and it, it's, it's delicious. You know, I go to Columbia. I want to eat stuff with mustard. I wouldn't want to do a regular thing, but when I go to when I go to Columbia, I I, I like to have mustard based uh, sauce. Uh, but uh, we now have what I, I mentioned: the International House of Barbecue. That's uh, re- these distinctions are being blurred and softened and. Personally, I regret that, but that's just because I'm a localist and a traditionalist. I do want to ask you about uh, your your poetry, which are uh, also, of course, song lyrics. You you uh, mentioned that you self published, and and one can find it on your website. Uh, Poetic gems selected from the works of John Shelton Reed, uh, which you go on to say in your introduction uh, that these are really song lyrics. Um, and I, I was. Uh, <laughs> He said, you, you proudly sent your lyrics to a friend at Vanderbilt, a scholar with connections in the country music business, asking him if he didn't agree that it was a natural born hit, talking about one in particular. And you said you included your address to which your check should be sent. Uh, <laughs> have you, in fact, received any money for your song lyrics to this uh, point? I know one of them, at least, has been recorded. One has been recorded. And every two or three years, I get a check for, you know, three dollars and seventy five cents. <laughs> <laughs> like that. <laughs> and that was my tear spoil my aim that's right? my tear spoil my aim. a yeah. dear friend of mine who, who died last year tommy edwards multi-talented bluegrass musician i mean a great singer songwriter fabulous guitar player also plays banjo mandolin uh t- t- tommy wrote me some some a tune for it and, and recorded it and uh uh, he actually you know, it's, it's on a cd if you, you want to buy it mm-hmm. uh i think uh if i'm not mistaken there's a link to it also on, on my my website you can listen to it online yeah yeah you also had one called whole lot of geezing going on what's that about <laughs> yeah well okay um jerry lee lewis of course had a whole lot of shaking going on and jerry lee and i are roughly the same age and uh, members of the silent generation <laughs> which in his case is 
not, not exactly the right word, but uh, uh, we're all getting a little older now. And uh, I've moved to this uh, retirement community that I call the home just to annoy the marketing people. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're, all of us around here are of an age. We're all octogenarians, basically, except for the ones that are older than that. Uh, and <laughs> so we... Uh, 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 we're geezers, many of us, and the the the, the noun geezer implies to me the ver the verb to geese. So I <laughs> I, uh, I wrote this song uh, thinking about Jerry Lee in his eighties uh, called "Whole Lot of Geezing Going On." And, mm -hmm. uh, well, it's it's on the website. It's uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think it's amusing, but. You any song, as I said in the in the book, any song with a title that requires a footnote to explain it isn't, isn't, isn't going anywhere. <laughs> you, you you said that there where you're living now, you celebrate New Year's uh, at 9 p.m., I think. Is that right? Yeah, well, we did last year, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah next, year went out, next year we may not celebrate it at all, you know. <laughs> Well, there's a couple of other things I wanted to ask you about that I found on your uh, in your bio <clears throat> that just begged for some clarification or at least uh, shining a light on them. One is uh, that you were awarded the Order of the Longleaf Pine by the governor of North Carolina this year, 2023. What was that about? Yeah, well, it, it's uh, it's kind of like being a Kentucky colonel. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, it's uh, uh, some friend, a friend put me up for it. And uh, uh, I, I don't I don't know if anyone's ever been turned down. It's been nominated. <laughs> well, so it's like a lifetime achievement award. Yeah, something like that. And I've got a lapel pin, you know, and uh, I got a certificate. Uh, we were allowed to call ourselves ambassadors of the state of North Carolina, and we are obliged to propose the uh, the toast, the state toast, every chance we get. Which is, mm. And what is that? Well, here's to the land of the longleaf pine, the summer land where the sun doth shine, where the weak grow strong and the strong grow great. Here's to down home, the old North state. All right. Well, there you go. You, you, you fulfilled another requirement. That's right. This one, this one just jumped out at me and I have to ask you about it. Um, the dictionary of literary biography, yearbook Tomahawk chop award for deadliest book review of 1995. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. This is the book. I won't, I, I can't even bring up the, the <laughs> names right now, but it was a book about the South. It was just dreadful. I mean, uh, the Washington Post asked me if I would review it, and I took a look at it and said, this is so horrible. I, I, I don't, you know, my mother said, don't say anything. You can't say something nice. So I, I said, I, you know, I, I really don't think this book's worth reviewing. And they said, well, tell us why it's not worth, worth reviewing in a thousand words. <laughs> So, and you did. So I did. I, 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 of course, <laughs> I just unloaded on this this book. I feel sorry for the authors, but you know, because I'm author myself. I, even writing a bad book takes some effort. But uh, it was just so wrong in so many ways. Stan, I will send you a link to the. <laughs> yeah, to the please review. do. That just jumped out at me. I, at uh, first, I thought I had something to do with the with the Braves, but I, I no, see no, that no, it no, does no. not. Yeah, the, the book, the, the review is just basically a list of one thing after another that they got wrong, and and mm -hmm. they're. Dozens of them. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so it, it adds up to a really nasty review. I don't know. The I, I hope I never meet them. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, um, so, John, are you, uh, I, I guess, as we wrap this up, uh, we I, I earlier asked you, what does the South look like in 2023? Are you um, are you optimistic that something called the South will endure 50 years after you wrote a book by that title, is the South going to endure? I think it will. Uh, but that, uh, I, you know, I put my, I put my money on that side of it, but it's not, not guaranteed. Uh, I, th I think, uh, I've written an essay about this. I, I think you need to keep your eye on the, the word, the Southeast, because, uh, that's a, uh, the people are starting to say the Southeast where they previously would have said the South. Uh, and that is a uh, soulless sector. It's not, it's, it's not really a region. It's, it's just a quadrant. You know, uh, you don't talk about Southeastern fried chicken or Southeastern women or Southeastern uh, religion or Southeastern music, you know, Southeastern humor. It, it, it's, it's just, you can talk about, you know, business in the Southeast. <laughs> you can talk about, weather in the southeast you know 
but uh, Southeast has no culture. <laughs> so uh, I want to keep the South alive. So I, I use the word Southern if, if that's what you mean. Um, Southeast, Southwest, you know, if you're going to talk about commercial regions, yeah, the Southeast and the Southwest quite different. You know, Atlanta is kind of the capital of the Southeast and no way in which Dallas and Houston report to Atlanta. They got their own thing going out there. But uh, uh, that's when it comes to business. If you want to talk about music, you know, or, or humor, or accents, uh, Texas is very much part of the South, I would say, uh, and Oklahoma too. But uh, so... I I I I think uh unless the Southeast completely displaces it and we just stop talking about the South altogether, uh the South's gonna hang around. I'm heartened by things like Garden and Gun magazine, you know, which could come along. This this is a this is not your not your grandfather's South, but it's very much the South and and uh things like that are by talking about the South are, are keeping it keeping it alive. And they're marketing to the South and implies that this South is still there and that their success suggests that they're onto something. The hardest working producer and engineer in show business, the czar of our Tallahassee office, as well as the captain of the GHS horseback boxing team, is our very own Brendan Cannonball Crellin. Our Director of Communications and the GHS Ambassador from Long Island One Man Damn Yankees Fan Club is Keith Pinstripe Stragero. The GHS Empress of the Historical Marker, don't call them Monuments Division, is Elise 135 Word Butler. The Captain of the GHS Italian Wine Tasting Team is Rebecca Beerstein Bertina. Our GHS Director of Bean Counting is Greg Decimal Point Durkin assisted by our Accounts Payable Administrator, Amelda Checks. The director of the GHS Civil War Beard Division is Nate Brickwall Jackson Peterson. Our Off the Deaton Path fact checker is Ella Fino. The GHS Holiday Wardrobe Consultant is Don Weenow. Our director of employee loyalty is Upton Leftus. The Off the Deaton Path moving van driver is Carrie DeSofa. Our staff layoff specialist is Harry Verderci, assisted by layoff counselor Oscar LaVista. Our Off the Deaton Path HR director is Stella Payne Diaz. The GHS Russian intern this year is Igor Beaver. The Off the Deaton Path Elvis impersonator is Amal Shookup. Our staff director of Three Stooges Studies is Lee Iapoka. Dr. Todd Gross's personal eBay specialist is Selma Junkoff. And our Off the Deaton Path martini mixer is Olive Twist. You can find our podcast anywhere you can find podcasts. There's no hiding from this. You can find out everything about the Georgia Historical Society at georgiahistory.com and the Georgia History Festival at georgiahistoryfestival.org. Be sure and like Off the Deaton Path on Facebook as well. Please also visit deatonpath.georgiahistory.com and check out dispatches from Off the Deaton Path, my blog, and similar campaign for real podcasts like this one. Stay safe, stay strong. I'm Stan Deaton with the Georgia Historical Society. As always, thank you for listening.